Hello, Collateral Gaming listeners. Chazzle Dazzle here from the Trial by Air Variety Show podcast. I just wanted to take a few seconds to invite you guys over to what we do. No, it's not video games, but we do invite really awesome and unique bands from all over the world. We dig deep into their souls and find really cool stories to tell you, and there's tons of music every week, so subscribe to us wherever you subscribe to your podcast. We look forward to having you. I'm Ashley Chancellor. I'm Zachary Gio. And I'm Megan Gomez. This is Collateral Gaming. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are here for part two of our episode on The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. If you haven't checked out the first part, please go ahead and check that out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever you're listening to right now, because we are going to dig right back into where we were before. Anyway, continuing on from where we were at, I I guess we kind of pretty much talked about the uh, the Song of Time, and I have right here on the itinerary, it looks like I wanted to bring up a point about the masks. The masks are amazing. There's a ton of them in the game. There's uh, four transformation masks and 20 miscellaneous masks. The transformation masks are amazing, and they're incredibly innovative. Can we just jump into, like, our favorite ones? Cause... Do it. Okay, so yeah. my personal favorite for the transformation mask, it's a tie, personally, between the Zora mask and... The Goron mask. I love the Goron mask, especially in the fight against Goat, because you're just rolling around the arena trying to keep up with him, and it's super <laughs> intense. And it, it's honestly one of my favorite boss battles in the entire series, simply because of the way you use the mask and the Zora mask, just because I love how it kind of gives you that first glimpse of adult Link in Zora form and your abilities when you're using the mask are incredible. I love how fast you can swim. I love your attacks, the fins, and it just... For the graphics, it looks super cool. Oh, you're so, going to hate the 3DS version of Majora's Mask then, because they completely, <laughs> Why would you? They completely no. revamped the Zora swimming <laughs> mechanics. Honest, so basically, like you move slowly now when you're Zora Link, but, you, um, but when you consume magic power, when you hold R to bring up that electric shield, that's when you can move fast. So you have to consume magic to swim fast. That's ugly. Why would they... Yeah, no more dolphining. Why would they throw that in the game? And and what it's broken too because you know you have to use a lot of Zora Link maneuvers inside the Pirates Fortress, for instance. In the original yeah. game, there's no magic to be found in the Pirates Fortress. It just doesn't spawn there, right? In any of the <laughs> the pots, because it wasn't necessary. They they kind of position things based on their relevance to the situation, actually. But in the 3DS version, they didn't fix that by putting more magic there, like which you which you should if you're going to make players rely on magic more. So they just completely. Um, broke it. You you got to go into Pirate's Fortress with a green potion, and you're not going to know that ahead of time. <laughs> so they took a really difficult game and made it harder and more difficult to just traverse. Good that, job, Nintendo. Good, good job. Good job, Nintendo. Way to make things more difficult for us. I appreciate that. I don't even want to play it now. Okay, we'll get into it in a minute because there's some things I really, really like about the 3D remake. But that's one of the most controversial changes. That right there is probably the worst change down. So it can't get any worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all uphill from here. <laughs> yeah, I know she said your, your favorites were the, were the Goron and the Zora. So I would be inclined to say the same because I, I do like the Goron. You know, we, I do like the goat fight. That's yeah. really awesome. Just like you said, being able to move around as a Goron. I love the Zora swimming mechanics in the original. Um, <laughs> the only thing that, um, the, but the only the only mask that I like more than all of those, and we talked about it in our top five Zelda items. It was the number one on my list. So obviously, it's going to be my favorite mask, which is the Fierce Deity mask. Yes, oh, yeah. I know that it is. Um, it's optional. I know that you can only obtain it at the very end of the game when you have all 24 masks and it's pretty much just used to fight Majora. And even when you reload it, you can only use it in boss fights, but God damn it. Those few moments of the game where you can use the fierce deity mask are awesome. 
And, and then the 3D version added fishing holes, which is, eh, and I didn't really ask <laughs> for it. Don't really hate that it's there, but but you can <laughs> you could use all the transformation modes for whatever reason. They allow you to use fierce deity link in the fishing hole. Um, in addition to the boss arenas, um, you can't leave. You're too scary. <laughs> but you can't leave because you're too scary. Yes. <laughs> I remember you telling me about that, and I lost it. That's great. Yeah, the, the postman <laughs> will literally t stop you and say, "Like you're too scary. Like I can't let you go out like that." <laughs> um, but I mean, I guess kudos to them for for bringing, trying to to bring the fish dating mask in more. But um, it's not as bad as the giant's mask, which only gets used in one boss fight. <laughs> You, you know, if, if they were going to try to implement bringing in the Fierce Deity Mask more, they should have made it to where, like, if you're at that point in the game and you're, like, on the, like, the dusk of the, or night of the third day, you should be able to pull it out anywhere. Just because people all around, are they going to be more terrified of a kid wearing a mask that makes him look like just this brute force of nature? Or are they going to be more terrified of the giant fucking moon that is about to come in and just smash into Termina? What's the difference? I'm sure it was just a technical decision. Like they didn't want to uh, spend the time to make the resources because they had less than a year of development time, right? Yeah. So I'm assuming that they, and Nintendo just didn't want to, you know, didn't have the extra time to, to craft the mask so you can use it everywhere else. So they just mm -hmm. allowed people to use it in the boss arenas. Because I, 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 it was, you know, it was developed to work with boss arenas. It's quite a bit bigger and I think would like, I think if you if you glitch it or or you use like an emulator and you hack it, I think the fierce deity frame like stands bigger than some of the doors in the game with the sword and everything. So it'd be uh -oh. clipping through everything. And yeah, they could have spent another. They they probably would have had to spend at least another month on development just implementing the fierce deity link to work in all areas. So I, I understand. Yeah. So in the 3DS version, didn't bother to put in that much extra development time either. They pretty much left the game as it was with. In regards to most things, well, I can that's smart on their behalf. You know, you don't want to even even if you're remastering or remaking a game, like there's still experiences that the players remember in certain aspects of the game that you don't want to take out. Like for example, when we were talking about Spyro, um, you know, there was a couple of things in in that game, you know, that they didn't they they modified a little bit, but they didn't necessarily take out because you know, like they don't want to switch up the game too much and take too much of that original experience away. So I can kind of understand why they didn't, you know, keep the you know make it to where, you know, you can use the Fierce Deity mask more. Because, I mean, I agree with you. It's a very powerful mask. And I think that players would use it a lot more given the chance. Um, and I think it would kind of make the game almost almost unfair. Because um, they, it, they gear, I, I don't think it was intentionally, but they geared it to be the most difficult Zelda game out there. Um, yep. So. I, I will um, say this. On it. Sorry. <laughs> um, I will say this. Um, I like how awesome and how powerful you are as Link with the Fierce Deity Mask on. But I wish, for the fight with Majora, I wish they would have made it, you know, I wish, instead of making you just, like, severely OP and you can take out Majora in probably less than two minutes with that mask, given cutscenes and all that, forgetting about that, I wish they would have made it to where putting on the mask would have made you an even match with Majora. Or it would have made it just a little bit easier instead of making you overpowered. And the fight without the Fierce Deity Mask would be almost impossible. I wish they would have done that. Well, Fierce Deity Mask is canon, apparently. That is the uh, Hyrule Encyclopedia confirms that the Fierce Deity Mask is canon to is canon to the story. Link does don it. So, and I, I like that because it carries the weight of every mask that you obtain in the game. And I mentioned this when I when I said that it was my favorite um, item in, in, in the series of um, um, all Zelda time, and it's my favorite. That's my favorite boss fight. I think on my top. I put in my top five gaming boss light thoughts. I put that as number one in a bonus round. And the reason why is it just carries everything from, from throughout the game. Every side quest, all of the experience, and, and everything that Link went through coalesced into that one mask. And, and so that's what it might mean so much. And yeah, it makes Majora a joke, right? <laughs> that yeah. boss fight is not as... It, it's, it's just too easy. It's... But... It's just the power of it. And if you want to fight Majora and it be hard, just don't use the fair Stady mask. But God, yeah. it just it's just so awesome. <laughs> yeah. I can't disagree with you there. It is pretty it's empowering. No pun intended. <laughs> it's empowering. Yeah. Because you had to struggle a lot to get there anyway. So you spent the time. So yeah, the game gives you an easy way to defeat the boss. You know, it's the ultimate fuck yeah, like I I earned this. <laughs> <laughs> you had no idea it was coming. <laughs>
<laughs> so that, that that's why I like it. But yeah, what was your favorite mask, Megan? Um, I'm gonna have to agree with you guys. Definitely, I definitely would say probably the Goron and Zora as well. Um, I do love the Fierce Deity mask. Don't get me wrong, but I think Goron and Zora just kind of have a, a little special place in my heart. Especially, um, you know, the Zoras are my favorite in the in entire series. Love the Zoras every time. Yeah. They're bae. Everybody knows that. Everybody loved Azora. Doesn't matter. Also, I something that I did want to talk about, because this was like a big thing as a kid. No one wants to talk about how terrifying it was every single time you put on a transformation mask. Yeah. I skipped the scene almost every single time. Haunting. And I remember being a kid and yeah. thinking, like, I remember friend's mom was like, if you act up, you're going to end up like Link and you're going to end up, you know, screaming and, and whatever you... You're oh, gonna have that's terrifying. <gasps> and I was like, no! And I was like, oh, crying. Oh, oh, it was so bad. So shout, out, shout out to your mom for making Zelda references for punishment. I, I like that. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think, well, I mean, like, like I've said before, like, my parents are older. My parents had me way too late. <laughs> but my dad said, I guess uh, my friend's mom had told him about it. And uh, he goes, don't make me turn you into that Goron thing. And I was like, Dad, stop it. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's and hilarious. Like, like curls up into his own body. And like all of a sudden you just see brrr, with all the spikes and you're like, no. Yeah. No one no one wants to talk about that. But that's probably the most iconic part of it for me. Because I just remember that scaring the fuck out of me as a kid. Um, <laughs> also, um, I guess going into the other masks, I guess I'll lead into the, the next point. Uh, one that I guess was the most memorable for me was probably um, the bunny hood. Um, yes! I, I really <laughs> run everywhere with the bunny hood in the extra save. I would just run around. And then <laughs> um, uh, the couple's mask. That one got me because it was just so weird looking and like kind of more funny. And yeah. I was like, you know what? This is weird, but I'm liking it. Let's just run around in it and see what the people think. And, and you get the couple's mask as a result of the Andrew Cafe side quest. So. Yeah. You know, it really means something. It actually has only one application in the game afterwards, which is used to get a piece of heart in the mayor's office. But yeah. a lot of the masks are just symbolic of what it took to get that mask, you know? Yeah. Most mm -hmm. of them unlock other masks or unlock heart pieces in some way. I can't think of a mask that doesn't do something for you that is just a monument. But the couple's mask definitely feels that way. Where, you know, it's just kind of the symbol of what you did to get there. And now you have this mask, which you'll wear only one time in the game in another place. But you have it. And you earned yeah. it. And, and, and again, the power of all those masks combines, you know, at the end if you, if you manage to get all of them. But I, I love the couple's mask simply because when they give it to you, they just kind of sit together and wait for the end to come. And yes. they, have no idea, they have no idea that you're about to, you know, reset time again to start but they're just kind of like together holding hands waiting they're for the finally end to come. together after yes. the agony i i think that there's also a lot of great uses from the great fairies mask i know that's probably controversial of me to say but whatever i'm still gonna say it probably because i love the great fairy um and the stone mask is <laughs> pretty cool as well that one was a little annoying for me in gameplay but i still thought it was pretty cool stone mask is is is, is i think the way to get through pirate's fortress oh absolutely that's the only time that's useful for me another change they made in the 3ds version I don't know if I if I hate this or love this. I I think I'm okay with it. But essentially, and I understand why they did it, but the stone mask isn't found outside Iconic Canyon in the 3D version um, by Shiro. You actually find Shiro in the middle of the Pirate's Fortress. So you have to get through the Pirate's Fort Fortress at least halfway through on stealth alone. And then you can get... Um, the only problem with that is is that, again, because they leave no magic in the Pirate's Fortress for you to use... Um, another, you know, again, they didn't, they, they, again, with the Pirate's Fortress and magic, um, you're not likely to have enough juice having wasted it on Zora Link to use the lens of truth and see Shiro. So <laughs> in execution, it kind of wasn't done as well. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't shock me. I like the concept. I like the idea of forcing players to at least have to rely on stealth, but yeah. I, I, I do like uh, going back to the Great Fairies Mask. I love collecting the little fairies inside of each of the dungeons. And yeah. I will yeah. give like a little honorable mention. It's the first transformation mask you get in the game and you kind of, you're stuck with it in that form for oh. most of the first part of the game, the Deku mask. Deku and mask. I, I love jumping across the water and the little hopping noise. Little, hip, hip, hip. 
<laughs> yes. It's so, so cute. cute. And how you can like blow little bubbles out of your snout or whatever that thing is, a little stump snout, whatever you want to call it. Okay. And it's just like. Ee! I'm glad that you feel that way because a, a lot of people, like, I don't think anyone's favorite mask is the Deku mask. I mean, it's a cool transformation, but Goron and Zora and Deity were just were just so much cooler. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and they're designed to be that way because you get them later on in the game. Well, also, because, like, you got to think, like, you think about the, the Goron as these big buff guys. And you think about Zora as these beautiful, graceful, you know, you know, warrior type, you know, swimming bitches. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And then, you know, you get to the Dekus, and the Dekus are just these cute little babies, and they're just so adorable. So it's like, for, like, girls, you know, like, we're like, oh, my God, it's so cute. We get to have the Deku mask. And the guys are like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, why? (laughs) You know what, Zach? You need to start playing the Deku Palace theme in the background now, okay, while we're talking about this. (laughs) Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> you pause the podcast. I'll go learn it. <laughs> <laughs> I just, just imagine, just, just cue. See, we'll just that's that's what we're gonna do with your trumpet, bro. We're just gonna start having you play in the background, <laughs> just right, just like you learn you learn it in advance, so that if we talk about that particular thing, you're just gonna go, and we'll, <laughs> and we'll have it on the Skype call and everything, like just randomly in the Skype call. You they see you pop out with, with the, the trumpet. <laughs> Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 da. Dude, oh man. I guess that kind of humming that kind of brings us into our next point. Of course, you know, in the game, the Ocarina of Time returns. You know, they bring it back as kind of like your main source of restoring the peace to your own sanity. Just when you're about to run out of time, you can just play the Song of Time and bring yourself back. But kind of tying into our transformation masks. Every single uh, character that you can turn into has their own, like, sort of instrument. Like, with the Gorons, you have the bongo mm-hmm. drums. Um, with the Zora, you have the guitar. You have the Deku pipes. And, of course, your classic old ocarina. And I love that, you know. I, I, I think it would have been weird if, for some reason, as each specific character, you just still pulled out a tiny little ocarina. It would have yeah. been hilarious to see well, Goron Link pull out of that race. I think it's cool that you're, like, bringing a piece of them with you. Um, and, and it's part of like who you become when you put on the mask, like you're embracing that kind of that culture, you know, like for the Gorons, you know, like I've said, they're all buff and strong and you get to bring, you know, their amazing friggin' drums. Like every time you think of Gorons, you think of them rolling around and you think of their, their drums. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's so iconic. The Zora guitar, you know, like for me, like I thought it would be more, I thought it would be kind of like switched. Uh I thought that, you know, like when I was a kid, I was like, why does the Zora have a guitar? And why do the Dekus have pipes? Like, I never, I thought it would be you know, flipped the other way. Because, you know, like, why would the Zora have access to wood to make a guitar but whenever the Deku were wood? Because this is made out of bone, right? It's like, it's like made of like fish bone or something. Yeah, I don't know. I just thought it was weird. I, I, I thought maybe like the, maybe one of them would use like a lute or something different. But I guess, you know, like. Kids don't really know what that is. At the same time, I got to think of the the audience that they're trying to capture here. Yeah, hey, you got to bring in history. You got to bring in music history. If they don't know what a lute is, go look it up, children. <laughs> <laughs> but guitars is so cool. Okay, because here's why: Majora's Mask even has some elements of of modern technology in it. Termina is a completely different world from Hyrule and happens to be more technologically advanced. And if we follow the theory that it's all Link's imagination, <laughs> the, the, you know, the popular fan theory, then it kind of doesn't make sense how he would know about future technology. But if we take the Hyrule Encyclopedia's explanation, which came out years later, more recently, um, the entire world is created by Majora's Mask and, and it ceases to exist as soon as Link leaves. Kind of like Koholan Island in... Um, uh, Link's Awakening is—is is that a spoiler? Should I should I should I bleep that out? I think I'm no, gonna bleep because, that out. No, because Link's Awakening came out, you know, back in late '90s. You know, that's not a spoiler. Okay, okay. If you say so, there are some people that that would get pissed about it. If it is a spoiler, go play the game. It's been yeah. out for if like 22 years. It's 20 years old today. Come on now, guys. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> but yeah, no, no. So if we follow that, if we follow that explanation, which some fans refute, some people don't like that idea because um, it kind of makes it even darker, you know, because all these people cease to exist and it's kind of like Link did nothing. And maybe that's why the hero's shade is filled with regret that he's not remembered as a hero because not only was his timeline as a hero robbed away from him when he created the child timeline and um, 
prevented all the events from ever happening. So he was never known as the hero of time. And they mentioned that in the wind, in the wind waker or sorry, uh-huh. in, in, uh, uh, twilight, twilight princess. princess, right? Yeah. Yes. When you're learning the hidden skills. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Twilight princess. Well, sorry. Twilight princess is in the child timeline. Wind waker's in the adult timeline. Cause that's the timeline that link leaves. So yeah. Anyway, yeah. so the hero shade anyway, um, in twilight princess, is is said to be the hero from Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. And that was later confirmed, I think, in Hyrule Historia, which is when the timeline originally was officiated. Um, the multi-bar timeline that confused everybody when it first came out. Okay, split timeline Split timeline was known for years. Wind Waker and Twilight Princess were always meant to be a split timeline. It's it's in the story. Yep. What The only thing that the official timeline changed is they added the separate timeline. Um, which is, and I think that was cobbled together retrospectively. I'm not going to lie. Because it, it, the, if the fallen timeline, the if the hero dies timeline is kind of feels like something that was tacked on because we don't know where the hell to put these early games. But that's what they did. And, and that's <laughs> officiated. And I'm happy that it exists. And if you don't like the timeline, then ignore it. <laughs> but I like it. If you don't like the timeline, don't thought, play Zelda. You know, like alternate, like I thought it was like, okay, there's Link, right? And then there's Zelda. And I just always thought, especially like going through the games over the years, I just always thought there's this is alternate versions of Link, like the way that Link could have grown up in this universe or in this universe or in this universe. Like that's just it's the simplest way to think about it, guys. And that's just honestly how I thought of it. You know, yeah, like, the legend theory was was popular a while back Bef- before they officiated the timeline. I remember a lot of people. The thing for me is it never satisfied me. It, it almost feels like a cop out because some of the games do directly reference other games. The yeah. Wind Waker explicitly mentions events from Ocarina of Time, and so does Twilight Princess, and so does yeah. Majora's Mask. And, and like the reason why I'm bringing it up is it, it makes the timeline more meaningful. So the legend, time, uh, legend theory is good. I mean, if it works for you as a, as a player and that's the way you want to vision, by all means. But for me, I feel like it kind of takes away some of the, um, some of the value of, of meaningful story content. But maybe I'm just geeking out too much. <laughs> There's no such thing as geeking out too much when it comes to The Legend of Zelda. It was made for us to geek out about. Yeah. That's why they installed the timeline Man in the first place. Man would not place. release an exclusive collection of shoes and merch if it wasn't for geeks to geek out about. Hell Just yeah. Me. I still have them. Yeah, that's one of Spencer's best gifts to this day. Okay. I'm sorry I, I cut you off there, Megan. I, I, I think I just get really passionate about Zelda timeline discussion. Yeah. No, <laughs> um, and I think also, like, I do agree with you, you know, like, I, if we do ever do a Twilight Princess one, I'm going to be the one geeking out, because I know this is, like, y'all's big one, but for me personally, like, my personal favorite is is Twilight Princess, just because, you know, it's such a harsh dynamic. Yeah. It's so I, dark. I, I, yeah. And it's kind of interesting how, like, the Ocarina of Time always returns, and how um, in... in Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time, you know, the older ones, it, it brings back... It keeps bringing back this essential kind of tone. It always kind of just brings back this sense of like the same kind of feeling. Like it's a it's a former life coming into a new life, kind of like what is it they call it? Um, I'm trying to think. I, I want to say like regeneration, but I know that's not it. Like how? What's their name? Like um, God, my brain is like still in choo choo. Um, <laughs> Sorry, my my brain went into parent mode for a second. I'm I'm starting to think about my daughter because I just heard her crying and. <laughs> straight mom mode i was like baby crying what yeah happened? yeah i just went right into dad mode like i was like oh shit and i just suddenly i kind of zoned out <laughs> sorry i went into straight uh single dude mode where i'm just like what's happening <laughs> <laughs> thing crying what is going on <laughs> oh bro that's depressing we're gonna we're gonna play like a hello darkness my old friend <laughs> well uh, put that in, um, in post right <laughs> i have more time to play video games it's okay <laughs> all right all right that's true. No, you're so right. You, with a child, you lose. Childs are blessings in many ways, but for for a while, you lose the ability to uh, to play video games as much as you used to. Um, around and you, you around what you work as it is already. <laughs> but hey, you lose the ability to play video games, but you play the greatest game of all. Life. life. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. But Zach, just yes, don't ma'am. ever. Ever, ever let somebody tell you the newborn phase is the worst. Wait until they turn two and a half. Oh, no, that's the demon toddler phase. Believe me, I have three nieces. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I've, oh, God man. Screaming monster sometimes. And I absolutely love her. But I'm just like, why can't you just be cute and cuddle my hand like when you were born? Just stop, please. 
I'm just yeah. I'm just waiting for her to be a little bit older so I can start I can start playing Zelda with her. That's gonna oh, be yeah, fun. Man. I can't Make wait Majora's to, Mask to do the that. The first game she plays. <laughs> oh yeah, that would be tough. No, because in some ways, or pull, what is the first game that Hazel's gonna watch me play? Yeah, Majora's exactly. Mask. Well, she'll have a false uh, sense of uh, difficulty with the whole series. She'll play this game first. She'll be like, "Oh my god, this is ridiculous. This is Dark Souls, and I have ne- I haven't even played Dark Souls." And then she's gonna get to get good. Twilight Princess. And no offense, I love Twilight Princess. It's one of my favorite installments, but. The first two hours, they kind of hold your hand and treat you Good. like you've never played a video game before. You know, I I, I think I think we would probably start with something like, like Twilight Princess or something like that because um, Ocarina would be a great starting point for most people, but for for new players, you want something that's gonna um, that is gonna hold your hand a little bit more. So it, it would be interesting. I definitely wouldn't do Majora because Majora relies on you understanding Ocarina. Uh, yeah. And yeah. the game was directly meant, and you can tell in the gameplay, they don't spend any time on tutorials. Um, they jump right in because it's the exact same controls as Ocarina of Time. So w- with some minor things that, that Tattle does remind you about. But um, you can go to the dojo to learn to pick up skills if you need to. Yeah. That's an optional event. But um... <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. We're not wasting any time in the dojo. <laughs> well, you get a piece of heart for it, so... But that's for the that's for the challenge where you where you basically just have to jump attack the ten logs. That's all you have to do. It's just sometimes the positioning is hard because Link goes one way and doesn't go exactly where you want him to, and and you miss the opportunity. <laughs> Nothing will ever be as difficult as the slingshot slash bow and arrow game in Iral Castle Town in Ocarina of Time. True. Uh, okay. I I am so good at this at the swamp shooting gallery and the town shooting gallery in the 3DS version. I am absolute trash at it in the Nintendo 64 version, and I know I've gotten perfect on them both before. But goddamn, the I mean, the controls do feel a little antiquated. They are difficult to get to, and it adds to the challenge when you're playing the original version. <laughs> I know you guys are just listening right now, but if you can see Megan's face, she's just shaking her head. No, you guys suck. <laughs> oh. No, 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 no. Okay, no. I'm all about the just gyro controls. Those gyro controls introduce a level of precision you just can't get with an analog stick. <laughs> Only if the game does it well. <laughs> so maybe for me, because I played it on the 64, you just have to know when to hit the stick at the right time. It's on the original console, it's all about precise timing. Muscle memory. It makes me so mad that I'm literally just like internally screaming and staring mm-hmm. at the screen bright red. And I'm just like, ah, I can't handle it. I, can't. <laughs> I will say. God, I want to cry right now. <laughs> the uh, town shooting gallery or any of the mini games in Ocarina of Time, it has the best music. Mm. ever i was just kind of humming it to myself if anybody was like focused in yeah i heard but you. it's uh, it's like a demented circus theme almost and it's it's so good and they just kind of sped up the zelda theme for the other games but I mean, we should I'm saying um no song will ever match malamar <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. I, I literally, okay, so Alan never played a lot of Zelda when he was a kid. He only played a little bit of Ocarina of Time. So I was like, oh my god, this reminds me of Malamar. I don't remember what we were listening to. I think it was like a rap song, and just the background of it reminded me of Malamar. And I was like, woo! Woo! And he was like, what the fuck are you doing? And I was like, you don't know what Malamar is? So I made him listen to it for 13 minutes on repeat while I was doing the Malamar dance. <laughs> See, now that, that's what marriage is all about. <laughs> you have to make your spouse watch you do the Malamart dance for 13 minutes. <laughs> that is awesome. I agree. Because <laughs> do you really love someone if, if, if you don't, if you don't do, if won't do that for them? Malamart is the Nintendo Geeks uh, Gangnam Style. <laughs> oh, you know, while we have a chance, maybe um, I, I want to kind of talk about the dungeons. Because... Yeah. There's only oh, yes. there's only four of them, right? So there's not a lot. It's like a Breath of the Wild in that in that aspect. But you know, for one thing, the lack of dungeons is uh, is made up for with the plethora of side quest content. Um, and we'll, yeah. we'll 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 talk about that too. But yeah, let's just talk about what what dungeons are there, right? What what did you guys think? Do you have a favorite dungeon? Um, I love the Stone Tower Temple. <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> so yep. Sorry. 
I love the Stone Tower Temple because you don't go through it once. You go through it twice. But the second time, you flip the whole dang thing yes. upside down. And it is so cool. Yeah. I Okay, I will be honest. I hate Snowhead. Because right before you get to the boss, there's like a small, precise leap that you have to make. And if you fall down to the ground, you have to climb all the way back up. And it takes like... If you're not exactly like, if you're not good at like remembering exactly where to go, it takes like an hour to climb back up, even after you've completed everything. Yeah. And it sucks. But the Stone Tower Temple is amazing. For one, the Mirror Shield is one of the best items in Zelda Dungeon history. I will forever and always love it just because of the mechanics and reflecting light and all that. It's incredible. And Stone Tower Temple does it very well. But when you flip the dungeon upside down, I didn't know that was going to happen my first time playing yeah. the game. And I was just like, are you, what? Yeah, Are you serious? it's it's almost like Forest Temple vibes in that sense, but it's its own thing. Yeah, and and, mm -hmm. and Stone Tower Temple also brings together all of the mechanics that you got to use throughout the rest of the game. You have to use all of the transformation masks, so it's an excellent test of your skill, and it has an excellent diver uh, diversity uh, of puzzle types. And it made the number one for me in my top ten Zelda lists. Um, I have a bonus round episode out on that as well, and it was just me. Um, you and I, Zach, we did the top five Zelda items, but I remember the top ten Zelda dungeons um, was back in the day, and I <laughs> I soloed yeah. it, man. Uh, it was it was difficult. I, I don't know about do the quality. One of top 10 Zelda songs. On yes. yes, that, and we should like revisit that for like a bonus round sometime either this season or next, where we just come back and the three of us come together and collaborate and make one giant list together where we rank them. I think that would be really cool because. To have, I mean, of course, some of us will have the same dungeons on our list, but to come together and just to create one giant list of all the best dungeons in the series for us, that would be oh, a lot of fun. The we, best we could dungeon? Do something. Oh. We, could do, series. we could do an entire bonus round episode just dedicated to that, like like dungeon recommendations. Um, oh, God. I, I can't even think of one right now that would be, like, my favorite. Like, I can't even... That, that hurts. I, I think will, we honestly could. I'll, I'll, in this game, though, I think my favorite would probably be Great Bay. Y'all probably will disagree, but uh, Great Bay's really one, cool, though. Like it's it's so it's, cool more... and it's so fun. Like that one's really fun to me. Like the other ones are more challenging. That one felt more fun and like woohoo, let's go. It's <laughs> one of the water dungeons in the Zelda series that doesn't suck. Yeah, most water temples suck, which I think is why I love it so much. Because I'm like, uh, like I dreaded it because I knew that there was gonna be a, there's a water temple in every game, and it's always a fucking dick, and I hate it. Right, and then it's <laughs> like a Great Bay. And Great Bay is a blast. And it's like the black sheep of the water temples in the Zelda series. Mm -hmm. It's like, this yeah, one like, is really fun. Yeah. I'm, with, I'm with you, Megan, in your love for Twilight Princess. But the Lake Bed Temple is the worst dungeon in the whole game. It sucks. It's the worst dungeon probably in most of the games. I, I, you know, I don't know. I like it better than I like most water dungeons. Um Best water dungeon for me probably goes to Ancient Cistern because it's yes. it's, the, it's the least annoying water dungeon. <laughs> it does it's a water dungeon that doesn't feel like a water dungeon. Um, I will say Majora's Mask water dungeon, uh, Great Bay Temple is 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 pretty uh, uh, pretty. What was I gonna say? Uh, it's pretty tame. Lax. No, not lax, pretty. but it's yeah, it is pretty. But it, it's it's pretty uh, tolerant, tolerable. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, like for this game being so hard, like this felt like the easiest part for me, and I absolutely loved it. And I was like, "That that was the temple." What? Yeah, it, it's definitely a tolerable water temple. It does drag on in bits, but it it ultimately it's kind of the first temple I think I really actually needed a guide with, because um, I wasn't exactly sure where I was supposed to be going and what I'm supposed to be doing, but um, and, and what the actual goal in mind was. Like you don't realize they're halfway through the dungeon what you're actually attempting to do as a central dungeon dungeon mechanic, but it is pretty cool when it all adds up. Um, as far as uh, Woodfall and Snowhead go, I think those are the dungeons I've played more than any other because I've been doing a lot of uh, three-day challenges. And oh. three-day challenge, you have to get through... You have to play through the game in kind of a machete order. I haven't really talked about this yet, but there is... Within the Zelda community, there is what's referred to as the three-day challenge or six-day challenge, some people call it. Um, but aside from the original three days that you have to spend the first cycle that, that you have to spend uh and and you you have to reset at the end of as a deku okay forget about that obviously that's not part of the three-day challenge after that 
we have basically completing the objectives of the game, going to all four temples and getting to the moon within one three-day cycle. And it is possible, not on the 3DS version. Another thing I, I hate, I think my least favorite change about the 3DS version was that it's impossible to do the 3D, the three-day challenge now. And I've never actually done it, but it is possible on the Nintendo 64 version. But you have to play through the game in kind of a machete order. So you have to go to the Woodfall Temple first and get the bow. Warp out. You got to go to the... You warp out. You don't finish the dungeon then. You have to get to the uh, Snowhead Temple and get to the Fire Arrows. Warp out. And the reason you're doing all of that is to use the Fire Arrows to get the Powder Keg certification. Use the Powder Keg to open up Romani Ranch and get to Epona before the first day is over. And then a visit Econa Graveyard on, on the first night. Yeah. So but how far have you got? I'll now? say collectively, fuck Spider House. <laughs> The spider. Oh, the spider. Yeah, this, there's several actually mini dungeons in this game. Yeah, yeah we're kind of just like spinning out. Yes, there is um, there any there is mini dungeons. Um, so you've got the pirates' fortress, such as I know we've been talking about throughout the this episode. Um, there is beneath the well. Uh, there's the ancient castle of Ikana. There are of course the moon dungeons, and then the absolutely beloved spider house swamp and ocean. <laughs> yeah. You know I, you love it, Megan. You know you love okay, it. Like, Mind you, I don't mind bugs, but I hate the spider house just because. I hate spiders, so it, it, it does kind of freak me out a little bit too. It's just it's it's creepy, and it just reminds me of like wannabe serial killer vibes, which I wouldn't want. But I feel like that would be something that would happen in Termina. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it, it kind of you hear the scratching, and it's just. Uh, um, I I generally save those for the end of my playthroughs. I I don't yeah. really want to get forward to them. I mean, they're fun. But it's just so creepy the whole time. Um, the second one, the ocean side, is, is, is I think better than the swamp spider house because um, there's some additional side quest stuff in there. But um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the GBs, man. The really good thing about the dungeons and the way they work in this game is it's definitely the Zelda game with the least amount of main dungeon content. I mean, with Breath of the Wild, it's a completely different feel. Hi, Hazel. <laughs> with Breath. <laughs> With uh, with Breath of the Wild, it's a completely different mechanic just because the dungeons feel different simply because you can enter and exit at your leisure. You can There's no transition. There's no... Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's big events to get to those dungeons, but you can come and go as you please, and it doesn't feel as momentous. With Majora's Mask, these four dungeons are the most monumentous checkpoints in the game. When you get there... It is a big thing, and like even getting to Woodfall for the first time, you've already done a significant chunk of the game, and you've already basically mastered how to move as a Deku, how to get through yeah. the uh, Deku Palace, mm -hmm. and it's just, when you get to these places, it's so awesome, and beating these dungeons, getting the chance to have that warp point out, you know you can come back there anytime you reset and fight that boss, so that's awesome. If you thought the boss fight was awesome, you can come back and fight him again as many yes. times as you want. Come back and slap him in the cheeks with the <laughs> fierce deity mask. Yeah. And it's just no other Zelda game does it like this. I mean, Skyward Sword kind of comes close with the animation of Link walking into the dungeon, kind of like you've come this far. Now it's time to go down the stairs and enter the dungeon and either try to find Zelda or upgrade your sword with a sacred flame. But Majora's Mask takes the cake with dungeon importance. And I feel like they're going to have to work really hard to match that. And if they can best it, by all means, dazzle me. Razzle, dazzle my soul. Yeah. Oh, God damn. That, I, I, I agree with you on the, um, the, about the bosses being able to revisit them and fight them. It's definitely one of the better aspects mm -hmm. of the game. Eliminates the need for a boss rush. Exactly. Eliminates the need for a boss rush. That, that's exactly what I was thinking. Um, and I appreciate the bosses as well because i mean for instance take the first boss that you fight odawa okay there is no clear pattern that will defeat him at least not in the original nintendo 64 version uh the three 3d version changed some of the boss battles and we'll get into that in a second because um i, I kind of have mixed feelings about that as well but with the four main boss battles in this game before majora um sorry in particular with odawa you, there is no clear strategy. You basically use what you have. You got bombs, you're going to chunk bombs at them, or you're going to do a crouch stab, or you're going to use the Deku flower that's in the middle of the room, 
and it's just whatever goes. And for a first boss in a Zelda game, that's challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just whatever. Any and, and, and Odawa is unpredictable. No, you know, one strategy that might work on him, one boss battle may not work the other just because of the way he moves throughout the battle because it's erratic and it doesn't make any sense. And that's something that when I say that Majora's Mask has some qualities in it that make the game more challenging just because of the lack of development time and the interesting development history that it has, that's what I mean. It's that some, like I said, Nintendo, like I said before, they cut corners in a way that they don't normally do, and it actually results in a more challenging game in a meaningful way. Um, it's an accidental success in a lot of ways. And I understand that Onuma isn't particularly proud of it, but he really ought to look at the impact because Nintendo didn't, they didn't run it, all of their accessibility features, which do make other Zelda games great, don't get me wrong. I'm glad the majority of games are accessible to a lot of people. But this game kind of, you know, in its original form, appeals most to veteran Zelda gamers, and that's what makes it special. 100%. <laughs> Sorry, I just went off on a whole, like, just tirade there, but I mean, that's why The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is one of my favorites. Um, it is my favorite alongside Breath of the Wild. I mean, yeah. unique uniqueness helps capitalize on a series. And while The Legend of Zelda was still relatively fresh at the time of Majora's release, I mean, The Legend of Zelda had, you know, its base, you explore the world, get eight pieces of the Triforce, fight Ganon, woohoo, it's dangerous to go alone, take this, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Ocarina of Time, open world, introduces Z-targeting. Same basic principle, very linear. You go to this place, you go to this place, get it done. Majora's Mask just completely takes that formula and says, hey, hey no, we're going to go a completely different route and we're going to shake things up a bit. And yeah, they went back kind of to the linear go here, go here, go here storyline. But just the fact that Majora's Mask was even released in the time frame it was released, a crunch time with the amount of beauty that it brings to the series it just kind of lets you wonder how the hell can they expand upon this for future games. Majora's Mask is a yeah. game that is basically unlike any other in the, I mean, you can play a horror game and you can be scared the whole time because something might jump out. But the very fact that you have to get certain things done in the face of impending doom with a legitimate time limit, literally impending doom with, in the, with a time limit, it's just, it's ahead of its time. It's beautifully done. And I'm not wrapping things up because I know that's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> but I'm just kind of going off on my own little Majora's Mask love tangent. No, we, we're here for it, dude. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I did kind of want to tie back into uh, what we're getting to, though. I, I think that it's cool that you get um, more side quest content than you would in, in any other Zelda game with this game. Yes. Um, I like that you saw the, the pieces of heart that kind of, you know, makes it feel almost like a Zelda game, even though it's pretty much not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I do like that, you know, you have, like, the collection of the masks with a side quest, uh, which which was kind of cool, you know. It's, I don't know, for, for me now as, as an adult gamer, it kind of reminds me of, like, completionist things that you can do. Um, of course, you're going to need all of the masks, but I like being a completionist and getting all the things. Ash and I have discussed this in length before. Yeah. We're both completionists, which is kind I, 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 which kind of ties weirdly into the next point. I personally didn't like how many bottles there were. Okay. I, you know, I like the, the six empty bottles. That's usually something a lot of people like about Majora's Mask because it's the only game in the series. Just a weird thing. It is the only game in the series to have six or seven bottles in the 3D version. Point one, 3D. Okay. Is, uh, yeah, the most in any Zelda game to date. I mean, Skyward Sword has five, right, Zach? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. If you've got the adventure pouch room for it. Right. So Majora's Mask has six or seven. And so um, why don't you like it, Megan? I, I'm curious to find out. Um, I think because you're already collecting so much stuff and then you're going out looking for bottles. I know because like, I, you know, like I said in, in the first part of this um, episode um, that you're, you know, I had to read so much in the guide and I was just, I felt like I had to get the bottles like quickly. Okay. And like, I love the fact that, you know, I had so many bottles. Like I, I love that, but it was just like, it was more things for me to collect. And like, there comes a point where I'm like, okay, I don't want to collect shit anymore. I want to go kill some bosses. But like, you yeah. do have to things in a chronological order <laughs> to be able to you know get to a point where you can save and quit or you know things like that so i had to get so many bottles in one freaking day yeah and they were already amongst you know the masks and you know other other items that i had to get i was just like oh my god what like i just <laughs> couldn't handle it 
that's a whole cycle right there just between getting all of the bottles that you need and then doing the yeah. pirate's fortress because exactly. um which you got to do at some point so you might as well dedicate a whole a whole day to it or be better about about getting the bottles in advance but you don't want to go to the pirate's fortress with only a bottle or two you want to go to have a good um three or four bottles um in order to if you'll nearly four if you're going to go in and you don't want to have to move in and out and that's kind of a calculus that you have to make when you're doing the three-day challenge and what makes the three-day challenge interesting is well yes the first two nights or i mean sorry but well yes the first day is is there's a strategic order on how to get through it you have to do it in that order because you have to get to the akana graveyard by the first night that's the only time to do a certain thing and you can only get upon a to get to akana graveyard and to get to great bay in the first day um, but other than that, the rest of it is what you want to do, and including what's kind of side quest stuff. And if you want to make the calculus that bottles are important because you don't want to waste time moving in and out, in and out of the Pirate's Fortress, you have to decide, okay, which bottles in the game are going to be good. If I'm going to get any pieces of heart, which I collect three during the first initial cycle, I collect the, the only three that you can get. Eh, technically you can get four if you do the postman game, but that's hard to pull off without the bunny hood. Um, anyway, you can get three in the first cycle, so I usually just get at least one more. Um, but again, I haven't completed the three-day challenge. I've never gotten past the first day, but I've pretty much decided my strategy once I am able to get past Woodfall before the first night, or past Snowhead before the first night. I haven't done it yet, managed to do it yet. Um, is I would want to get some of the boss. I'm already thinking about which bottles I would go and get. <laughs> yeah. Well, and yeah, that's just, I, I already thought that a lot of this game was harder than having to go through and get more friggin' bottles. I was just like, oh my god, no. Also, uh, I, I know that we've kind of been, you know, tangenting a little bit, so I know we were kind of, kind of want to tie back in. Um, also, sure. just in general, this game, it, I know that we've been talking about this the whole time. It's just so fucking hard. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I, I think that another point, you know, tying into the bottles is the fact that, like, you're getting some of the bottles and there's, like, a puzzle behind some of them and it's just a pain in the ass. And it's just, like, for fuck's sake, man, can I just get a piece of glass? Like, that's all I fucking need. Like, it's just. <laughs> yeah, this game is relatively unforgiving. Yeah. And it's, it's if you fuck up a certain area, it's going to let you know. And it's yeah. not going to let you kind of bounce back a little bit from fuck that. Up. Like, you don't just fuck up. You monumentally fuck up and it's just, <laughs> it's so like uh this game it took me forever to finish this game when i was younger just because there's so much shit that you have to do there's so much shit going on it's just like i i don't want to think about fucking bottles i want to go get a piece of heart i gotta go to this temple before the day's over and i gotta go run the fuck over here to this fucking castle because of this asshole and it's just yeah that's yeah. my answer monologue playing this game like i just and like i said before just the whole fact that you have to um and like we were just talking about just now yeah you have to plan everything out um yes. there's only one way to truly save so every time you play you sit down to play a, a three day chunk you know um in game time sometimes you don't need all of it sometimes you've, you've completed what you needed to accomplish and you can reset time early but you're playing and planning exactly what you're going to do and i think that's what makes it special for me is and, and gives it more of an open world component even though it's not as open world i mean if you look at the game actually the way it's presented it's pretty linear but because there's so many different things you can do and you can play each three day cycle differently and depending on what you've done in the main quest more side quest opportunities open up to you so and that's true in all zelda games that you can do the side quests in any order but majora's mask just make gives a whole different component of that in that mm -hmm. you know you have to schedule things certain um characters only ha do things on certain days and you have to think about that and you have to set reminders for yourself again one improvement the 3ds version does have is a reminders feature um or i think it's an yeah like an alerts or uh, alarm alarms i think is what they call it um tattle can care. can remind you for like you can set one thing you have to remember to do it, but you can tell Tattle to remind you to do something at a certain time. And it's just a general unobtrusive warning. It doesn't tell you exactly what you need to do, but just, hey, you, you, you didn't, didn't you have something you wanted to do around this time? And she says it in her sassy voice. So I, I, I do think that that was a good addition. That's not fair. <laughs> uh, unpopular opinion. I don't know if you guys will agree with me on this, but I like Tattle a lot more than I like Navi. 
Okay, no, I, I agree with you 100%. Tattle has so much more personality, and Tattle understands that you're a veteran Zelda player, so Tattle doesn't belittle you and, hey! and, <laughs> and is and Look, very unobtrusive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I like how every enemy scan, again, this game was targeted towards all creative time players. Every enemy scan is, you should already know how to defeat this. And it'll even chastise you. If, you, if you're, like, targeting an enemy and you're asking for Tattle's advice, she's like, shouldn't you know that already? Yeah. Yep. She's so sassy, and I like it, but also fuck Tattle, because Tattle is just, I don't know. The characters Tattle, are so much It's like, I'm already the queen of sass, so I don't need some some little girl trying to take over my, my, my place here, okay? Like, she's just too sassy for me. The, the NPCs are so mean also. If you notice, in Ocarina of Time, they're so polite. If you if you don't want to do a minigame, yes. they're all, like, overly polite. It's weird. It's such like, a weird oh. juxtaposition. They go, like... It's okay. You don't have to play if you don't want to. But the the all the shop owners in, in Majora's Mask are just downright like offended about yeah, it. Like, just like in Skyward Sword, right? <laughs> oh my god. In Skyward Sword in the Bazaar, yes. every time you walk away from a shop, they're like <laughs> they're, so, they're so they're so offended if you don't buy anything. And, and, um, and, and Beetle fucking drops you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my Hi. <laughs> that was Aww, pretty silly. Hazel agrees. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I like that you're trying to tie us back in, Megan, because yeah, we, yeah. we are actually kind of running up here. But yeah, I mean, as far as gameplay goes, I mean, did y'all have anything else to add? No. Um, actually, I, we've kind of hit most of the stuff that's on our itinerary, minus you know the actual gameplay and how the game looks. You know, it's it's not too different from Ocarina of Time. But you can definitely see some improvements in, like, the cell shading. The It's less blocky in certain aspects, you know. Yeah. It's It's got, like, no bugs in the game. And, I mean... It is relatively bug-free. Um, obviously, there are some exploits that uh, speedrunners are going to make it take advantage of, of. And some of those are even still in the 3DS version. And both uh, Ocarina of Time and Majora, got to give Grezzo uh, credit for that, is that they left some of the, the exploits in. Like, you can tell they were left in. Um, but... Uh, but and as far as Majora's Mask originally goes, there's nothing particularly game-breaking that you can do. I mean, and and um, like you said, they do make a few enhancements on um, the graphics from Ocarina of Time. And and the Majora's Mask remake is stunning. I will give it that, is that it is, it, it's, it is stunning. And it really, really, really added a lot of aspects, uh, you know, a lot of details into everything. Um, everything looks nicer. The only thing I don't, I'm not as crazy about is that they did lighten up the game, and so you kind of lose some of the dark atmosphere. But at the same time, some parts of, of Majora are just so dark you can't fucking see what what's going on. So, um, <laughs> what what about the story for y'all though? I mean, do do we have anything that we specifically wanted to talk about in in regards to the story? I know we've kind of inter interspersed that in with our gameplay. Because yeah, they're very interspersed. You, you, to know one is to know the other. But, I mean, I, I kind of wanted to get in some of these, like, fan theories and stuff, you know? I'm yeah. totally down for that. Um, I will say that Majora's Mask feels like the most isolated Zelda game. Because yeah. while you do interact with a lot of characters and a lot of NPCs, you are the only one that's resetting the timetable. You are alone. Every single time you start a new cycle, nobody knows really who you are. Um even though they might have known who you are and like got to know you on like a side quest or something like that. Once you reset it, it all goes back to normal. Yes. So throughout the course of the game, Link is basically on his own. The only character that's with him is Tattle. And that to me, I, I'm a huge fan of Metroid. Ash, you and I have talked about this because mm -hmm. of the isolation feel. Samus um, is pretty much. The only one. Yeah. 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 So Samus is bait. Oh, yes. yes, yes, yes. That's a whole other podcast episode. But, um, yeah, I love the feeling of isolation in games. Um, it's just I spectacular. Do. Feeling alone kind of pushes you to explore more areas because you want to open up more opportunities to interact with something, you know. And with Majora's Mask, that's no different, you know. Yeah. So as far as the story goes, it's spectacularly done, and the isolation is my favorite part. Yeah, I'm not, I, I can disagree. Um, I'm, I'm the type of player that, like, if I can have a companion, I'm going to have a companion. Um, I, I don't like being alone, especially, like, I think the most terrifying game, I don't know, if, I don't think we've ever discussed it on this podcast, um, but I know I've talked about it a lot personally when I talk about gaming. Um, Dead Space? Oh, okay. 
Because you're just so alone, and there's just these things coming at you like this, and you're, you're like, free, free, free. Yeah, not a fan. <laughs> but, I, I mean, it's it's kind of cool, but for me, I'm just like, why am I so alone? And, like, um, I guess going into theories or, or, like, feelings about the story in general, um, it's fucking depressing. Yes. Um, especially, like, watching um, Anjun Kafel just, like, or Kafel, Kef- <sighs> Kef- I always say Kafel because it, it, <laughs> uh, it was originally supposed to be Kafel, I think, is what Big Sister told me. Uh, uh, not if you look at the original Japanese. You, you can tell what they were actually going for. And I thought it was going to be Kafel for like a I long time. I thought it show. was Kofefe. I remember, I remember what it was now. For The graphic for the name always looked like an L instead of an I, so I always called it That's Kefel. what it is, yeah. You know, it, with one thing that it's funny, because Zelda, like enemy names and character names and, and just unique language names, unique terminology, is like so often mispronounced by the gaming community. But technically, there should be no reason for that, because the games were originally made, uh, you know, all, all these names were originally in Japanese. So you can go back to the Japanese and you can see exactly how it's pronounced, pronounced because Jap- right. Japanese is, is, is meant to be pronounced a certain way. And when Japanese is trying to emulate other languages, and they are here, they use katakana for most things. Um, you can tell exactly what sounds they're trying to emulate. So you can always go back and you can see. I remember uh, Peanut Butter Gamer, one of my favorite YouTubers, mentions um, uh, that he doesn't like the fact that it's goat, um, that he pronounces it got, but it is goat. If you look, look at the Japanese, it's goto. Um, cafe is cafe. Yeah. Oh, fei fei. Yeah, I, I, re- I remember, like, I thought her name was supposed to be Kafel, and, like, I had that, like, mixed up for a long time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's cafe. I, I, I remember ex- explicitly why she's like, I think like I thought it was supposed to be cafe, but it was cafe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, watching their, the, them just be so desperate for each other and be just so sad the whole game until the very fucking end is so depressing. Like, <laughs> It, Only to reset it all and make them yeah, completely like, alone like, again. You're like, my lover, my lover. And then you get to reset the fucking game and you're like, I'm a terrible <laughs> human being. I am fucking horrible. <laughs> you know, what, yes. if, like, what if throughout the course it. of Zelda games, Link retains all of these memories? <laughs> He's just like, man, I was a piece of shit as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's crazy is Link has to carry over the experiences of every day. You know, like I said before, this, this has a lot of Groundhog Day vibes. So um, when, when you're playing through the story, um, you're reliving the same things over and over and over again, and you're, and you're just trying to get everything right. You know, you're trying to find the, the sequence of events that makes everybody happy, so to speak. Um, it's so hard. It's it's like going on the suicide mission in Mass Effect Two and not getting enough fucking Paragon. Like God <laughs> damn, no, yeah, number two. Like fuck. So some people take it upon themselves to do that as a challenge, not as like a whole game challenge, but like once you've completed everything and you've done like if you've gotten hundred percent, which I always hundred percent this game. I think it's worth it. Well, I think my first playthrough, I 99%ed it. There's a one heart piece I didn't get from the goat mini dungeon um, on the moon because yeah, fuck, fuck that gore, fuck that mini dungeon, the Goron mini dungeon, and it's hard enough as it is in getting the piece of heart. But eventually, I did finish it on a playthrough, and I've done it um, at least on the 3DS version. I have never 100%ed this game, but Ash, before we started doing this podcast and I started playing the game again, uh-huh. I'm almost there. I'm like. 67 percent done nice it's worth so, it dude definitely get I'm all the masks blast. you have to get oh, all dude, the masks i've definitely gotten all the masks before okay. i was not gonna go through the game without getting the fierce deity mask because i had seen gameplay of it since i told you guys my first time playing majora was like 2011 2012 and so at that time i'm an experienced kid with nintendo and games and stuff like that and i wanted to and i had just finished beating the hell out of skyward sword and you guys know my love for that game so i dude oh yeah i i love majora's mask it's fantastic and i could not not get the first deity mask
Also, can we talk about how cute Skull Kid is? Yeah, okay, okay. I love Skull Kid so much. You know what? Fuck that kid, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same Skull Kid from Ocarina that that Link that Link teaches uh, Sari a song to, and they mention that at the very end of the game. That's that's what Skull Kid tells Link and says, "Aren't you the? Aren't you? Didn't you teach me that song in the in the Lost Woods?" So, um, or something to that effect. He's adorable in Twilight Princess. I don't know if that is the same Skull Kid, but he's what? He's adorable in Twilight Princess with his little horn. Oh my god! Don't even get me started. I don't even know if that's the same one. Probably, probably not, but it could be. Probably not, but you know, I I liked his appearance and I like how kind of he was teasing you, but also guiding you through the Lost Woods. It's pretty cool. Yes. They changed the design a little bit too, but yeah. That was that was actually <laughs> fun, and his um his move set in Hyrule Warriors reflects. It, it's mainly Majora's Mask, right? It uses he's got Majora's Mask on, and he's got the fairies, but they show some of the dummies from the Twilight Princess, so they Im- implemented some of the Twilight Princess moves into it, and I like that. But yeah, the Skull Kid is a compelling character. Dude, I love that. What's weird with Majora is, is that um. You know, even the antagonist isn't the real antagonist. You have the Skull Kid who's just possessed by Majora's mask the entire time. So Majora is the real villain the entire time, and that's the final boss. God, that is that is just a trippy boss fight. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, one thing that, that is interesting about at least the setting, obviously, as we've mentioned, it's a parallel world to Hyrule. Um, it's we've already mentioned kind of the uh, geography and how it's divided into you know you've got your your uh, clock town and, and Termina Field and Woodfall and Snowhead and Great Bay and the Akana region. One aspect of the setting of Termina that I think interests a lot of players is you know just the fact that it it, it is so odd. Like I said, it is a parallel world to Hyrule and that has its own implications. But f- fans have taken it a step long you know more than that, and they're saying that the entire world is in Link's imagination. That this is basically, I, I know I just t- I touched on this earlier, but it's Link getting over the grief of his own death. This is his, yeah. his imagination or his purgatory. Um, and uh, the game theorists have an actual, a really, really cool video on that. Um, I did mention that earlier in, in, the, in the, I think in part one, but that is just a, such an interesting theory. Now, obviously, and, and there's even, it's even supported by evidence, like the, the existence of the hero shade in Twilight Princess, um, like, you know, evidence in the game and, and just the dark themes that are explored, like, like death, you know, and there's so many complex adult themes that are just, it's odd to see them in a Zelda game. But alas, um, or maybe not so alas, we can feel a little bit better, but Hyrule Encyclopedia um, actually ended up revealing that that's not the case. But Termina was, was created by Majora's Mask, and it ceases to exist. The, the, you know, I, just, I, mean, I did mention this, that it, 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 it doesn't exist anymore. And it's almost like it, it kind of, um, it means that Link, you know, everyone you saved was for nothing. You yeah, know? And, we, and, and again, regret for the hero shade. <laughs> yeah. The fan theory also kind of makes sense with the hero shade as well. So it's almost up to interpretation. If you want to think of it one way, I think that it's absolutely um, what the player wants to inject into it. Absolutely. You know, and, you know, you can say that, you know, everything Link did for Termina was for nothing. But there's also a sense of, you know, self-realization and like self-promoted heroism, because even though Termina ceased to exist, Link still did that, and Link yeah. still knew that he was able, in that state, to show the courage and the heroism that he needed to get the job done. And whether or not, you know, thinking about that, knowing that because of Majora's Mask, Termina was created, and after the events of Majora's Mask, it ceased to exist. It's really sad to think about, but Link still did it. He still was a hero to people that he thought he needed to be. To yeah. a land that he felt like he had to save. And that's all what Link is about, you know, doing what he can to help his fellow man. I said it at the beginning of part one, you know, Link is an optimist. He's a light in dark places. And uh, speaking of light and dark places, we never touched on this, but I love the little evil bug creatures in the Woodfall Temple that you mm-hmm. have to shine with the light. Yeah, but sorry, a little split tangent, but oh, bye, Iris. She just, she's left. Okay. Okay. So we talked about the story. We've talked about even, I think, the graphics and the presentation. Um, one thing I did want to bring up is, um, you know, how did this game do among other, uh, among other Zelda games, among, you know, as a whole? I mean, obviously, it's a Zelda game. So I think initially yeah. it, it is going to have the, uh, the, the critical acclaim upon release that Zelda games always get. Um, 
But among Zelda fans, I do think that a lot of people um, among the Zelda community, it's not, it was not a, a, as well received originally. And, and it, it was. it's not really put in the same category as Ocarina as, you know, as a whole. But it kind of seems like a more recent thing. Like over time, it has become one of the most beloved entries of the series. Like I said before, you now have an entire demographic of Zelda players, you know, almost as many as Ocarina now who Majora's Mask is their favorite. I think it was just that initial difficulty curve that made the game less accessible. And and for a lot of people that turned them off, it turned me off originally too. But when you play Babies. it and you get into it, you know, oh my God, it is such a, it is such a beautiful experience just in every way. It is art. <laughs> I, what just happened? Did I accidentally? I thought you were <laughs> expressing your love. I mean, yes, we can, we can kind of say that I, guys, I accidentally clicked the heart on the Skype app and it like showed a giant <laughs> heart on my screen. I'm going to do it again. There yeah, we go. <laughs> will that come in the video? I don't know. It'd be cool. Maybe, hopefully, that would be lit. Actually, sorry if y'all see me spontaneously leaving the room. That would be my husband letting my cat in, and when the cat's not allowed in the bedroom. Hey, when you leave, I can see your Majora background, and I mean, yes, it's like Megan, come back. But that picture of Skull Kid is badass. Megan, come I back. just have hey, my picture. ceiling. Because I love the Skull Kid. He's so cute. Yes, yeah. I've got I've got Skull Kid up in my back. I chose a different background than in part one. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm on I didn't change computer. it because I love this one. I, I probably wouldn't have, but I was on another computer, so I had to pick one anyway. So I was like, might as well pick a different one. You know, after we wrap up tonight, I'm probably gonna put on Majora's Mask and play a little bit. Do it, dude. I I, I may too. Our next episode. <laughs> I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, we'll reveal that. Um, the three of us should low key do a let's play of the whole game. I, I am doing a let's play right now on Majora's Mask, but I'm not finished with it. If y'all want to Skype it at any point, I mean, we could probably do that. Um, it would be hard though. It would be hard to do because we there's no cloud saves and we can't play. Um, it's not like we can take turns. It'd just be watching one person play. But that would be cool. I or I feel like it would be a cool experience. Uh, I also want to do a stream of the of the three day challenge once I get it down. I'm trying to I'm trying to actually do it first. Once I do it. Then I'll be okay with doing a let's play on it because I can't mess up or not a let's play a stream a Twitch stream. Um, do it, <laughs> do it. <laughs> okay, so um, in, in any case, um, despite some of that initial criticism, I think uh, among you know Zelda players, it, like I said, it did have a lot of critical success and and it did well as far as uh, you know monetarily. It, it over three hundred thousand copies were sold in the first week in Japan, you know alone. Um, and now we have up, you know, to 3 million internationally. That's wild. You know, it needs to, that number needs to continue to go up. I think there are a lot of players out there that just haven't experienced this game for the reasons that you've said, you know, they're kind of looking at it as one of the, you know, black sheep of the series and they don't want to really touch it. But I think this game has the potential to be one of the greatest of all time. I mean, Ocarina is one of the greatest games of all time. It set the standards for, it, it set the standards for games today and to have, God, screenshots thank you for <laughs> to you know to make a game that's a direct sequel to one of the greatest games of all time yeah. which is something we don't really get in the zelda franchise we don't get sequels i mean of course breath of the wild 2 is coming out but majora's mask is the first sequel in the series and the only one that we have so far and to create such a beautiful illustrious and dark storyline immediately following up one of the greatest of all time people need to experience that and even though, yes, I'm very excited and happy that the game sold three million currently, there needs to be more. Yeah, there needs to there needs to be more. Uh, the 3D version has helped with that. What do you guys think about the cultural legacy that Majora has left on the Zelda fandom and and the gaming community as a whole? I mean, when you think Zelda, like you think of like okay, you think of Link in his in his green costume. You think of Princess Zelda. You think of the Master Sword. Master Sword. Master Sword, <laughs> and and you think of Majora's Mask. Like those are you know the biggest things that you think of when you think of Zelda. Um, you know, especially you know like we we discussed in the last ep or I guess the first part of this episode. I don't even know what to call it. You know, I, I talked about you know I've been to cons. You know, I saw a, a Skull Kid on stilts. Thought that was dope. You know, going through the cons, you see 3D printed Majora's Mask. You see, you know, it, it made on a tapestry. You see it in a pillow. You see it as a little chibi character. I mean, you see it all over the place because when you think of Zelda, one of the biggest things you think of is Majora's Mask. It's it's huge to many, many gamers. Um, as, as much as, you know, there's, oh, well, mm, Majora's Mask, uh, you know, like Ocarina's better or like 
Wind Waker's <laughs> better, Twilight Princess is better, Breath of the Wild is better. You know, like you when you think of Zelda, one of the biggest things you think of is Majora's Mask and that gold fucking cartridge. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, and you know, and, and even in, in the in the form of internet subculture, right? Yeah. I mean, it 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 has truly um, embedded its way, and it is a, a part of the Zelda gaming community. You were going to say something, Zach? Um, I was just going to say, um, kind of piggybacking off of what Megan said, um, you can't really say... I mean, yeah, you can enjoy one Zelda game more or less than another, but you can't really say that one Zelda game is better than another because they're all individual, beautiful stories that have their own take on the series. Yeah. And if unless you have actually taken the time to dive into Majora's Mask... You can't say that it's a bad game because like Ash and I said, when we first looked at it, we just we weren't really interested. But then we took the time to actually play the game. And now it's one of our favorites installments and not just the Zelda series, but video games today. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to look at it. You kind of have to look at it with a grain of salt and just say, hey, I, I need to jump in with this. I need to take a look because it might change my whole perspective. And as far as the cultural side, everybody loves a good hero, right? Everybody loves a, a good side to a story. But one thing that makes hero stories or adventures is a really, really well done dark side. And I think when it comes to the Zelda series, Majora's Mask is the dark side of the series that it needs yeah. because it's completely different from the rest of the series, but it still takes elements from the series and expands upon them in ways that games haven't done still today in 2020. And it's As still we've been referenced. Si Exactly. And as we sit here, as we have sat here for two plus hours, just talking about this game, that should tell you in a nutshell how three people have experienced this game in similar and very different ways, how it's impacted us. And there's millions of stories out there. So mm -hmm. don't knock it. Play the fucking game. Play it. Also, but something that I did want to bring up, um, you know, it's it's not going to be as easily accessible for, you know, especially like younger kids, you know, it, you know, like right. we were just, you know, how we want to bring it into the new generation. I do hope that there is a, 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 a I want to say like a reemergence of it. Um, uh, I, I is is kind of what I want to express. Um, I, I do hope that it comes back, you know, and especially in cultural reference because you know, like Zelda, is is more for older gamers. You know, whenever you think about gaming, you know, now like a lot of the kids, you know, they play COD or you know. I know Gears of War is still kind of recent. I, I know neither of y'all really played it. Don't make that face. I love Gears of War. <laughs> I've never played it. Fantastic <laughs> games. Um, kind of the first one's kind of weird. You kind of look like GI Joes, but besides the point. <laughs> um, you know, you think of you know so many different titles. You know, like a big one is like Destiny. Uh, but you love never really speak about Nintendo games as much, and I really want there to be you know a reemergence. The biggest one right now, of course, is going to be Animal Crossing. Everybody remembers that game. Everybody loves that game. Ain't nobody got to talk about it. Uh, but I really want there to be a reemergence of like classics like Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess. And, you know, I want I want the new generation to kind of have like their own version of like Majora. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I have an idea for that. And I, and I, I want to bring that up later. But one thing, one little tidbit I wanted you guys to to know. OK, as of the time of this recording, Majora's Mask is officially uh, 20 years old to the day um, in the <laughs> North American release. Okay. Happy birthday, Majora's Mask. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's the perfect it. month to talk about it because it's, you know, it's spooky month, but it also just happens to be the, today actually happens to be just by incidence. I didn't know. Um, I, I planned for this to be, to be on here way long before I found out, but just by incidence, we are recording on the day that Majora's Mask came out in, in the United States and North America 20 years ago. Exactly. <laughs> Which is insane. I was a toddler. It, what an impact it's had since then. You know, like yeah. I said, we, we talked about the, about about the impact in the in the gaming community, uh, and I touched upon earlier. You know how it's even it's even you know found its way into our and into the internet. And one of the most popular ways that it has, and something I don't feel like we can do Majora's Mask justice if we don't bring it up, um, is the uh, binge round or haunted Majora's Mask cartridge. Uh, creepy pasta slash ARG. Uh, I mean, y'all y'all are familiar with this, right? I mean, you, you've heard about it. I've yeah. heard about it. Yeah. It's utterly horrifying. One of the more famous creepy pastas of all time, I mind you. But it is horrifying. It is originally was a series of videos posted by Juduceable and then posted to it was either 4chan or Reddit. I think it was 4chan. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everything always starts on the chans. But. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> not that I not, not that I spend any time on the chance. I don't. Um, I'm I'm just I'm not I I I I don't even want to accidentally see child porn. Okay, I'm you know that <laughs> <laughs> you know like no, I'm not gonna spend any time there. But it, sorry, oh tangent. But <laughs> I don't even know what you do. Okay, we're we're buddies. We're not what, back. What 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 you do in your spare time is up to you, Ash. No, yeah. no, 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 no! Don't even joke about that, dude. Don't even joke about it because I got you. No worries. I... <laughs> I had to pull your leg a little bit, man. Okay, okay, fair. <laughs> Don't worry. Um. Okay. Anyway, so the uh the story originally started on 4chan, so it's a series of of text um, post with with YouTube links, and it shows what seems to be like a hacked version of the game, some some kind of emulator. And some people have actually gone through and shown like how Jaducible managed to pull off some of these things. But essentially, the whole premise is that he gets a um, lot, he gets a, a secondhand uh, Majora's Mask cartridge from a garage sale, and it ends up being haunted by an entity known as Ben. And, and, and there's a whole sub story, you know, there's a whole backstory with this kid named Ben who allegedly owned the game, who who drowned, and, and that's in the game. And it is just creepy. It is horrifying, and it's even bigger in scope than people actually thought. Most people are aware of the series of YouTube videos, which is just considered one of three arcs of, of the whole ARG, right? So it, it turns into, it has an alternate reality game component where people were having to not only watch the videos and, and find clues in the videos with, with all this lore behind it, um, but people were posting their own videos to influence what would happen, and they were getting videos in response. So players were starting to you know, show videos of Link doing this or doing that, and it would allow them to progress through the game. And then it brings them to uh, a bunch of like like discussion forums, and and there was I'm, I'm not even aware of half of it. I've kind of just per perused through the wiki in the past to try to get a scope up the story. And originally, the arc, you know, after its second arc, the the whole ARG went on hiatus indefinitely. The author decided he was going to move on to bigger and better things. He wanted to do a film. The film never ended up happening. And 10 years later, it has started back up. It started up this year again. Um, they're on the final arc now. And it's about, um, I haven't really gotten into it. And I wish I had because I had really, back in the day, I, I was like re learning all of this about the story and trying to get into it. But back up in March, and it's set to conclude by Halloween. Um, the final, the finality, the f finality, the finale of the uh, Judiciable story is set to close. Um, and, and I'm excited to, to hear about kind of what happens from that. I, I, I wish I'd gotten to be a part of the game while it was ongoing, but I, I'm so glad to see that it's actually starting to, because when I came to the party, I was late. It, it was already on hiatus for years. Um, and now it's, you know, it's about to conclude and I really didn't get a chance to hop on, but um, man, what it just, just crazy. So if you, if you don't, if you only know about the videos, you only know like maybe the half of it. I mean, it is, it is just insane how much level of detail and how much was planned by this guy, maybe even years in advance. There's some cryptic videos on his channel that just, just don't even get into like, like, like there's, there are some weird videos that are on his channel that were from years before he started it that seem to somehow tie in. They're just weird cryptic videos that make no sense. And maybe that was his plan the whole time. Maybe he was going to wait 10 years and let us think that he was doing a film, but he never did it. And he ended up using that website because he did using that website for the ARG. I don't know. It's fucking batshit insane. He started as like a college student and, you know, <laughs> it's absolutely brilliantly done. And if you want to lose a couple of hours of sleep, check it out. Check it out. Because I'm not going to lie, the first time I got into the creepypasta, I stayed up thinking about it. Because it's horrifying. Yes. You know, to... So many times. And, like, he's a completely different person in person. Just got to say that. Also, there is a cast member named Megan, and every time we see each other at a con, we're like, Megan! So, okay, so you guys know some of the some of the ends, or, like, ends of that, not just the videos, then. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with creepypasta. I've met him at every single St. Japan I've been to. We what? always end up... But yeah, I, I I meet him every time. You met every Alex time. Hall. Funny enough, um, he's just a I podcast actually, now. I don't know what happened to it, um, but I did have a uh, creepy pastas version of Majora's Mask with Skull Kid, and he's like hanging the the mask upside down. And it's like dripping. Uh, I had it signed a long time ago. I don't have it anymore. I don't know what happened to it. I think my dad has it in his garage. Um, but but kind of going into creepy pasta a little bit. I've met him multiple times and in person like he's not what you would expect at all 
He's like genuinely sweet, totally chill dude. Just like, hey, what's up, man? Hey, what's <laughs> just up? a genius. Sign something for you. And I'm like, I thought you were going to be like, hello, cutie. Can I sign something for you? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, sometimes he gets into character, you know, like I'll give him that, but completely different in person. Totally awesome, dude. Love him. Hopefully, I see if, if you're watching this or, or listening, Craig Pasta, I hope to see you again at next year's San Japan. I follow Frank. him on Twitter. I've kind of been following through the years to see if he'd ever bring it back up. And he was talking about the the judiciable storyline and, and the, the Ben Drown stuff, um, but mostly just answering fan questions or whatever. Didn't seem to be any 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 indication whatsoever. I'd pretty much given hope that he was ever going to return to it because he promised he would. But it just, you know, for for literally 10 years, his, his original videos are 10 years old now. Um, yeah. Nothing. Right. He, he was supposedly on an indefinite hiatus and then finally brought it back. So props to that dude that is fucking awesome if you plan this this whole time then i don't even know i mean i i you you probably have like a golden dick um <laughs> if if not then then at least props to you for for take for taking advantage of that time and, and really making people think oh, 15 carat knob <laughs> i don't know dude that, that is incredible and i'd love to get kind of read up more and, and figure out you know I, I i'd like to read back up on on uh arc three and see what's going on yeah ash when i'm able to get out there megan you too when i'm able to finally get out there to where you guys are we need to get together and like dive in depth into this because it's so awesome listening to the narration is so much fun in itself and the youtube videos are incredible because you know they show in detail what's being described and it's terrifying right. absolutely terrifying <laughs> i i just yeah spoopy i i can get into spoopy stuff but like yeah this shit is next level and it peer literally pressure like, peer pressure <laughs> <laughs> right? i want to be like you want to see some creepy shit let's go, hang out. Let's go. i like creepy shit like every friggin day this month he's been asking me to watch sinister or oh dude sinister is amazing i i know but it's like every day dude i don't want to watch sinister every day man I've seen the <laughs> tell alan i will watch sinister every day with him ethan hawk is amazing <laughs> you're boyfriend number 12 then what 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 say what alan all of his friends are his boyfriends it's just a thing it's uh-huh. dude sign me up bro where's, where's, the, <laughs> where's the permission slip i will like, if I can get money from my parents for lunch, dude, I'm all about it. <laughs> all right. Uh, Skype call says we're about an hour and a half in, so I guess let's let's sort of wrap it up. But yeah. um, I, before we do that, I do want to touch on real quick because I've mentioned it several times. So I kind of just want to really break down the 3DS version because I, I, I definitely oh, okay. feel like it deserves its own talking point, but also peppered throughout you know, some of the differences because – I have an interesting perspective on this, I think, because here's the way I feel about it. A lot of people aren't as big of a fan of the Majora's Mask 3D remake. There are things I love about it, and there are things that I'm not as happy about. In my opinion, they're first off, they're two different games, and I think you should experience both because there are some things about the tone of the original game that are just its impossible to copy, and I don't think they ever could have done it differently, if I'm being completely honest. Um, and then, But there are some things that the 3D version does better that's really worth checking out both and, and kind of getting a different feel for it. You know, and th- this was developed by uh, Grezzo, who did the Ocarina of Time 3D. By the way, Ocarina of Time 3D is the definitive version of the game. Hands down, uh, Wind Waker HD is the definitive version of the Wind Waker. Those are excellent remakes. Twilight Princess is good HD, but um, it, 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 I think it definitely needs a little bit of work. Um, it definitely could have yeah. done. It could could have been more. It looks the same. It, it's pretty much they they really they, they really should have expanded on it. But I will say it's the better version of the game. It doesn't do anything bad. Uh, Majora's Mask 3D kind of take some steps back and it, that really hold it back from being the definitive version um, but it did start development immediately after ocarina 3d on the suggestion of miyamoto and what's funny is nintendo outright i mean and they've been known to lie sometimes just to outright keep something in secrecy um they straight up um were, were saying like there's no plans it's not going on aonuma neither confirmed nor denied the existence of it there was a whole operation moonfall like fan cry for it and Apparently, Aonuma was somewhat surprised by that, but evidently someone at Nintendo, Miyamoto, did know that this this was going to be in the works. Um, and Aonuma was playing Majora, the original, while he was developing this, so he was keeping a, make, a list of adjustments to make the game, quote-unquote, less unreasonable. I'll, I'll bring up why I think that it, it, it does incorporate some of that, but sometimes it's not the best. Um, apparently, there were ideas and themes from A Link Between the Worlds, which was being developed at the time, incorporated as well. 
here are the main differences, okay? First off, Ocarina of Time 3D features, just like, um, uh, sorry, Majora's Mask 3D, just like Ocarina of Time 3D features, gameplay enhancements. Um, we've got touchscreen controls, gyroscope controls, um, and a lot of changes. Some are good. Like, I like the rework song of Double Time. They really did a good thing there. What they did is, in, in, in the original, when you play the song of Double Time, it acts like the sun song. It moves from, from day to night, night to day. But in Majora's Mask, it moves you to the next half day. So if it's the, the first day, you're going to jump to the first night. If it's the first night, you're going to jump to the second day. So it's helpful when you need to do something at a certain time, but there's still a lot of waiting in Majora's Mask, which in my opinion is artificial difficulty. I think it's a, it's a weakness, it's a flaw, having to sit and wait around for something to happen because it happens at a particular time. So the rework song of Double Time in 3D version fixes that. You can, you can specifically skip to a specific hour. That's a good change. That's a quality of life change that needed to happen because it means there's no more waiting. Waiting is not fun. Nobody likes to wait. It is not a good gameplay element. Don't do it. It is artificial difficulty. Nobody likes it. Um, I like that the Bomber's Notebook was revamped and actually made somewhat useful. Like I said, they added the alarm system. They added more characters and more things so you can specifically remember there's a log of every every reward that you've gotten and, and what people and schedules of what people do um, or when they're available at certain times once you've encountered them once. Um, we've got addition, an additional side quest that has the extra bottle <laughs> um, like like it needed another one. But hell yeah, more, more side quests, I'm all for it. Lucky number seven. Yeah, lucky number seven. There you go. Yeah. Um, different placement of items and rewards. Some of this makes sense. I can understand why they did it. Um, some of it is kind of weird. I, I, I think instead of they replaced the bottle in the um, in the graveyard with a piece of heart. They put the and they, they replaced another piece of heart from a mini game with a bottle. And it kind of was weird because the 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 hints on the gravestone specifically reference a bottle. But whatever. They added the Sheikah Stone, which is an accessibility thing. I think it's a good opportunity because what it allows people to do, like Skyward Sword, like Ocarina 3D, um, you can get hints. And if you don't want to use them, you don't have to. It's just there for new players that don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. We've got glitches and bugs that were removed and just general quality of life improvements. Right? Neither one of y'all have played 3D, right? No, I have nope. not. Okay, that's why I don't want to just, I'm just kind of just run through this real quickly. But as far as negative or controversial changes, um, one of them is uh, honestly just a complete tonal shift for the entire game. Remember how I said originally in the, in the game, you can only truly save whenever you uh, reset the cycle by playing the Song of Time, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, y'all know that. So in, in, in 3D, they added the ability to save and continue. The owl statues that are normally just save and quit and delete the saves are now um, save and continues. And I can't really argue with that change. I think it was necessary. Uh, Majora's Mask's thing that holds it off from being as successful, as successful as other games is its accessibility, its lack of accessibility. And with it being a portable title, I, I do think that that was a necessary change. I'm not sure I would have done any different, but it does change the tone of the game. I kind of wish there was a separate master quest or hero mode that featured the original way and also the original um, time slowing mechanic because I hate that the 3D cha three day challenge is not possible, that the game only, Inverted Song of Time only slows you down to half time instead of third time. What they should have done is make that the master quest is where time runs faster and where the save, the save statues work. You know, maybe mirror the world, maybe um, double damage, maybe no hearts. You got a pretty good hero mode slash master quest, right? Yeah. I really think the fact, it really just changes the tone of the game, and I wish that there was the option to play it the original way, at least. The boss fights, I said, I, I, like I said before, I have mixed feelings about. I like that some of the boss fights have more clear strategy, but you've completely changed what made the Odawa fight unique. Yeah, I've heard about that. So I, I really think the fact, it really just changes the tone of the game, and I wish that there was the option to play it the original way, at least. The boss fights, I said, I, I, like I said before, I have mixed feelings about. I like that some of the boss fights have more clear strategy, but you've completely changed what made the Odawa fight unique. Um, and, and then, you know, fights like Yorg and Twinwold were, were changed so that they have two phases. Cool, that's a good change. I'd like to extend the fight. The second phase of Yorg is just bad. It's just, just not fun. So they, they really missed the ball in there. But it does force you to use the Zora mask, which apparently you don't have to use in that fight. So I like... That, that they forced you in all the boss fights that you have to use the Deku, Goron, and Zora masks. Okay, I'm here for that. Adding the Giant's Mask midway through the battle in Twin Mold is cool because it makes it a necessary item instead of an optional item. And also, it, it changes the way the boss fight and you have to fight them kind of one at a time. I, I do like that 
but I hate what they did with Giant Link. They remove his sword, so you fight the second twin mold with your bare hands, and it's weird. It, it does the the you know the you know the Super Mario sixty four thing where Mario spins Bowser. Mm -hmm. yeah. So long, gay Bowser. So long, gay <laughs> Bowser. Yes. <laughs> Link, Link does that with twin mold and on, on Majora's Mask three D in the in the second part of the fight after you get the giant's mask. So not a vibe. Adding the giant's mask in. I mean, what was kind of cool about the first game was that giant's mask was an optional thing. You could easily miss it. And you would have to fight Twin Mold, and it was almost impossible. But if you got the Giant's Mask, it was much easier. I do like how they, and that was a cool component. But I, I, I'm not offended by the fact that they, they cut the fight in two, added a two face fight with the Giant's Mask being a necessary requirement for the second half, and not being able to get it until the second half. That that was kind of cool, kind of like what they did with Shiro in the Pirates Fortress. Forces the player just, again, in the execution, it just wasn't, it wasn't right. The Zora swimming mechanics. I don't think I need to mention that. They even changed the the way that the Zora Moon mini dungeon, and it is a thousand times worse. What was originally a fun mini dungeon has turned into a chore um, because they had to switch, and you have to hit these switches in order to open up the gates. And, and it's just frustrating. It's not as fun as just trying to pick the right path. So, And, and that came along with the Zora changes. I wish that they had just added the ability to swim fast. You know, It could have just been a simple way to work that into the controls. And then have the magic. Bear. So introduce the slow swimming mechanic because one of the things about the original that, again, accessibility-wise made it a hard game is that it is really hard. Players had to force themselves to learn how to maneuver Zora Link around, right? Yeah, that's true. It was It's pretty hard because he always swims fast. So I'm okay with them adding a slow move, swimming mechanic, but add the fast swimming mechanic that's not locked behind having to use magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's... That, when you told us about that, I was just not a fan at all. And that's one of the things that kind of, that right there kind of put me off from playing the 3D version. I mean, yes, the game probably, I mean, most definitely looks 10 times more beautiful and it's probably way smoother to play. But t making yeah. the owl points a save and continue instead of a save and have to quit. I mean, yeah, it was a kind of a move they had to make, but it also makes the game beautiful in its own sense it makes it difficult yeah exactly it completely changes the tone so again i just wish that the original style of play was there and then the one last thing that gets on my nerves i know it's minor but deku hopping works different now remember how if you spun right before you started hopping across the water in deku form you would carry your momentum with you yeah, yeah. it was it was a part of the game that you kind of had to naturally master and learn how to operate deku link efficiently but once you did you were just zooming and you learned how to how to get across things and move things fast and it's again pretty necessary for a three-day challenge to learn how to do that um mm -hmm. and and so and it added a, you know just a, a different layer you know that's kind of gone it's there's some momentum if you time it just right but it's it's not the same. You don't carry all of that. So, you know, it kind of made the, the Deku hopping a little bit more of a chore to do and not as fun. That's my last nitpick there. Um, there's a lot of nitpicks, but a lot of them just really change the way the game feels. Yeah. So if if they ever redo that and they, they, they port it into a Switch version or whatever, um, I would like them to bring some of the good things that they did, but leave behind, you know, just revert on some of the other changes. Honestly, Majora's Mask is almost almost a perfect game exactly the way that it is 100 mm percent, -hmm. absolutely dive into it play it be like me 100 percent it 100 well, percent it not yet i haven't done it yet so i'm sorry. be like ash i think i 100 percented it like once or twice all right so anyway i guess um we'll go ahead and wrap up here what is your final thoughts megan um final thoughts would be um you know tying in from the first half uh, this this game was part of my childhood. This was, you know, one of the purest games that I can remember in the sense. Um, it was just a truly fantastic game for me. And, you know, I, I, I loved it so much as a kid, even though it was so difficult. Uh, this game was, you know, truly challenging, uh, really intense, and it really made you strategize and kind of think about what your next move was. And and it was such a, a cool game to be able to, even, even though you were facing this impending doom of this big, faggot, ugly face just coming down right at you. Um, it, it, it was such a great hero archetype for me. I, I don't remember too much of it as an adult, you know, now coming into, you know, like full blown adulthood, I guess you should say now that I'm a dental gone hitched, <laughs> I, I would say, you know, this is definitely, you know, a game that I want my future children to play 
you know, once they're ready, gotta, gotta <laughs> break them in a little bit. You know, we can't just straight up put the bit in the horse's mouth here. Um, but I, I definitely, you know, am really, really excited for, um, my future with this game. Um, and I'm glad that I can take, you know, this time in, in, in my adulthood to kind of go back and look at this game that kind of did help shape me as a person today. <laughs> well, uh, I guess that leaves me. Go for it. This game, um, like I didn't touch it until I was, you know, well, till I was about, well, no, 2011, 2012. I'm not going to do the math on how old I was, but, um, needless to say, it took one of my favorite series and it completely threw me for a loop. Because I didn't like it at first. I didn't like it at all, and I didn't want to give it a chance. But once I actually decided to bite the bullet and get through the first three-day sequence, I realized just how special this game would become for me. And I didn't, I didn't want to put the controller down when I first started it. And to me, Majora's Mask is a beautiful addition to one of the most fantastic parts of my life. And with it being as challenging as riveting of gameplay, it's dark elements, it's light elements, the side quests, everything that you can do, the dungeons, it's just spectacular in every way. And like you said, Ash, it, it's perfect the way it was designed and mm -hmm. with the fact that it took them less than a year because they wanted to rush it out makes it that much more special to, for them to be able to create something so beautiful and so profound with such a different take on a series that people have come to know and love. It's spectacular, and yeah, I'm about to hop on it once I get off this recording, but Majora's Mask is one of my favorite games of all time, not only because it's so difficult, and it takes a, a series that, you know, forgive me for saying this, but Zelda is relatively easy if you're experienced at it and you have played the games multiple times. It doesn't matter how many times you play Majora's Mask. That shit is hard, Yeah, and it, it's that difficulty that makes it such a riveting experience, and it's not something you ever want to forget about, and yeah, I, I, I absolutely love it. I don't have too much more to say, but it's it's a spectacular game, and I can't wait to hop back on the sticks. Hell yeah. Um, again, uh, Majora's Mask is, you know, much my favorite game of all time. One, one of two, anyway. Um, and what I love about it, I, I mean, we've kind of pretty much talked throughout, really just nailed everything that makes Majora's Mask. It is the Zelda game that I know the best out of any Zelda game. I can literally, in my head, I can go through, because um, I've done enough attempts with the three-day challenge now, that I can I can walk you through Woodfall and Snowhead Temple. Um, <laughs> just Part in three. my head. Yeah. <laughs> Part three, right? <laughs> I, I definitely want to do a stream trying that trying that out, because it's, it's something I've always wanted to do. I'm not really like speedrunning usually, but the three-day challenge is something to me to just seem like an obvious conclusion that you'd want to... Is it possible to do it in, in one cycle? Can can you do it? The answer is yes. It's just, it's very difficult. <laughs> That's why I haven't managed to finish it yet. But yeah, any anywho, Ocarina of Time is um, one of my favorites. Um, I love, again, both the original and the, the, the Ocarina of Time. Ugh. <laughs> Ocarina of Time is one of my favorites, but <laughs> a little bit lower on the list. Majora's Mask is my favorite video game of all time. I've got, uh, and I love both the original and the 3D version for different reasons. When it comes to what makes the, the original so special, I, I do prefer the original for that reason, but I like the way that 3D plays better. I do like the, the better graphics, the better sound, and the controls are way, way, way better. Like just modern controls really, really makes a world of difference. Um, if they had just kind of messed with, tweaked with the physics a little bit and made the physics more like they were in the original, but it is much easier to control and it's kind of hard to go back to N64 controls, you know, with that. Yeah, you ain't got no Z button. But yeah, it's no wonder. It's one of my favorites. Um, I have ideas for like a direct sequel um, where it would be like Link moving back to uh, to the world of Termina because Majora's Mask takes place with um, Child Link, the same Link, you know, two years after Child Link and Ocarina, right? It's the same Link. So w my idea would be Link would come back as an adult, the same age he was in Ocarina of Time um, or seven years later. So he'd be in a, maybe a, a two years older than he was in Ocarina. And then, but, but seven years have, have passed for him and like 70 or 700 years have passed for Termina. And so you would, you would awaken in this world that was on the scope. I would take, it would be the scope of, so would be combining the ideas of Breath of the Wild and Majora's Mask. And I think the Breath of the Wild format is what's here to follow. So my idea would be, um, you have a Termina that's the size of Hyrule in Breath of the Wild and, and Clock Town has now become Clock City. And so the technology is now, it has like a steampunk feel you know, with kind of this clockwork stuff going on. Hey, you put some thought into this. I have put a lot of thought. I have like notes and notes and notes um, of, of, of just ideas for this. 
and you would have all of the transformation masks back, um, but the, the controls and, and the way that the game mechanics of the game would work more similar to Breath of the Wild. I would get into it, but you know we're kind of running low on time here. Okay, so season three. Are you guys hyped? Three, yes, one hundred percent. We are playing my absolute favorite game of all time this season. I can't wait. Wait, we're um, playing Crossing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, you don't gotta tell me twice. <laughs> we've we have got um. Yeah, we, we, we have got a lot, a lot, a lot of cool games coming up. We mentioned one of them during this podcast. Um, I'm, I'm All I'm going to say is that, is that a, a, a title was dropped somewhere. But I think we'll try to keep most of it a secret and reveal it as it comes along. But this upcoming episode, um, we're going to go ahead and do our Halloween special. We're going to try to cram it in and get it out by, by, by next week. Or no, by the... the the week after next of the time that we're recording. So early November, right after Halloween drops. Um, so stay tuned for that. We're going to do a Halloween special on Until Dawn. I wanted to do a horror game, and and I've played it, and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, but it's also... I, I'm not going to get too much into it, because I obviously want to save all of my opinions for the uh, for the next episode. Y'all ain't ready. This I'm, is an intense-ass game. I'm telling you guys, we need to start a Let's Play at 9 p.m. and we have to finish the game before dawn. <laughs> no pun intended. I'm Maybe just... some night owls, but I'm an old lady. I need to go to sleep. <laughs> you know yeah. what? You're right. Me too. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I work tomorrow, but I'm probably going to be up late playing video games anyway. But maybe do some more uh, Majora. But yeah, I got through my first playthrough of Until Dawn. Managed to kill all but... I mean, managed to leave alive all but one character. One, I only managed to kill off one, so that was good. I, I think that that's pretty good, um, all things considered. I didn't kill everybody, uh, just just one. And and to be honest, it, it was it's kind of difficult. We hope that you'll come out and enjoy the spooky with us, even though it'll be post Halloween. I know there's going to be those uh, those people out there that every day is Halloween for me. So you know, <laughs> we're excited for you guys. It's around the time, and we'll be doing our Halloween themed bonus round episode. Um, by Hall we'll have that out on Halloween Day as well. That's that's what I want to ask you guys about after we hit off is um, if you if you know y'all want to jump in on that um, and some ideas about what we're going to do because I haven't planned it out yet. Our next episode next month. Would you, did you want to talk about it? <laughs> no, 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 no. I was just going to say, if you guys are still with us, this has been a relatively long one, and we appreciate it, because we've had a shit ton of stuff to say about this beautiful addition to the Zelda series. And, you know, we, we could probably keep talking about it for a long time, because it's absolutely really good. Thanks for sticking with us. Yeah. And it was awesome to finally get to meet and do a collab with Megan. Hey! <laughs> podcast me and ash have been grinding ever since my first guest appearance on the trilogy which is just blossomed into something awesome and i really appreciate you guys and i appreciate the people that listen to this you guys are awesome and it's nice to you know build a little family off of this so hell yeah i feel that bro much love man that is that is it is awesome to to do this with you guys and i'm really glad that i have two um three you know, we have three three co-hosts that are super super um, into this, love it, are always wanting to talk about it, and 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 you know, live, breathe podcast. <laughs> so yeah, uh, excited for Until Dawn. Our next episode is going to be The Last of Us, uh, coming up in November. So that's going to be another two part episode. It's going to be our pretty much our, our 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 one release for November as a monthly episode. We have a couple of um, game launch episodes that are coming out. Um, I think we'll reveal those in due time, but. Um, Hold on, I think Hazel muted you, Megan. <laughs> it was Hazel. I was wondering, like, <laughs> uh, how do I unmute uh, you? And collateral gaming muted Megan, and I was just like, that. Okay. Wasn't <laughs> that I was. Almost, did you not find it be funny? Did I do something rude? What that the was, hell? Like, that Megan was Hazel. Was She's pushing angry. buttons. Um, so Last of Us Part Two. Awesome. Really excited about it. I've been playing the hell out of that. We're doing a lot of launches this season. I am so excited. Um, we're going to be getting into, um, I guess, a lot of content that people didn't think we'd be getting into because I know we kind of do a lot of retro games, but I'm excited to be going into, you know, being able to do launches, being able to do new content, you know, what's coming out. I, I'm. This is the kind of stuff I really, really like to do, especially newer games. Like I just, mm, then I get to talk about the graphics and it's wonderful. And I yes. Just, yes. Dude, we're good. Eat the hell out of the last of us i'm so ready for it ah uh, it's gonna be awesome we, dude I, the whole time even since you know we we have started discussing season three 
to purchase it. I've been waiting for the podcast to play it. So I hope you guys love me because I've been waiting for you guys. And I played the original oh. when it came out and I pre-ordered it. So, Oh, man. it is You are going to love every second of that game. It is spectacular. I, I mean, the first one already made me ball my eyes out like a little baby. So I'm terrified. I'm probably going to end up going to like a post-game depression. You oh. are. 100%. So yeah, guys. Um, if you like this podcast, please, please leave us a feed, uh, leave us feedback, uh, give us a five star review on Apple Podcasts, and tell your reach friends. Reach out to us. Tell us what you think. Hey, yeah, reach out to us. You know, and I always say this, but um, you can find me directly on social media. I'm on most social media channels. Look me up, Ashley Chancellor. I'm happy to friend people, and as long as I can tell that you're not a bot. Um, that you're not just like a Russian bot, I more than likely will accept your friend request or follow you back. You can also um, follow Collateral Gaming on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. That includes Apple Music, Spotify. We're on Chill Lover Radio. Um, we have YouTube, and we're going to get some more um, Patreon content to, to come out and some more video podcasts that we're going to do on YouTube. Um, Really, 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 really excited about so many new games that are coming out this season. Excited to be sharing it with some awesome co-hosts. And yeah, <laughs> I think that was an intentional heart, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for your continued support, for getting us to, I think we, we clocked out right almost to 3,000 downloads. I'll have to check the number again by the end of season two. And that was my goal was to get to 3,000. So if we got pretty close to that, I'm, I'm pretty happy. Um, now let's shoot for, for the same as Collateral Cinema, shoot for 6,000, 7,000 by the end of this, this next season. And we will be golden. But stay golden, guys. And if you enjoyed this, then, then please stay tuned for more. And Oh, man. Thank you so much. Oh, bagels. All righty. <laughs> Episode. Well, this has gone on long enough, but it is, after all, our season premiere, and it is in two parts. So, um, obviously, uh, you've had the chance to uh, listen at your leisure. So, that being said, I'm Ashley Chancellor. I'm Zachary Gio. And I'm Megan Gomez. This is Collateral Gaming, and we are out. Bye! Collateral Gaming is an L Company production. All music and game clips are owned by their respective creators and are used for educational purposes only. Please don't sue us. We're poor. <laughs>